Okay, so let's see how it goes. Um, so it took me a while to do a setup here because the uh, yeah, machine kind of decided not to do it uh, the way I had anticipated. But now we're getting back to it. Um, so welcome back to the session. First of all, first order in place, let me count people. That's my favorite hobby. Also, it's a good exercise for me in arithmetic. Hang on, eins, zwei, I have seven here. There's more than seven in the room, so you know the rules. Anyone who hasn't yet, please uh, just uh, check in uh, properly so we're on the safe side. Um, okay, um, not the remote ones, of course, but that's not a novum. Um, continuing, I understand this uh, session a lot of the, or some of uh, our students are actually obliged to participate in another seminar, as far as I understand. So I'll take this into account when, when um, planning this session a bit. Um, but first things first, first of all, thank you very much for joining in increasingly large numbers. So, you know, I see a lot of new faces I haven't seen yet. Uh, before. So uh, it's great that you actually take the opportunity and take your slot effectively in uh, participating. I think it's a slightly different experience than if you're at home and uh, watching the stream, right? Because uh, I'm also, admittedly, I must be, admit I'm not the best in being torn between looking in the camera, looking at you guys, interacting with people on the camera, and with, it's a mess. It's a mess. So if, as far as I'm concerned, I'm looking forward to having all in the classroom. But that may well be a half a semester out until we have that opportunity again. So let's see. So until then, let's use the space, uh, you know, um, uh, creatively, I guess. Um, okay. So coming back to to the point, a um, few things that I want to discuss, and uh, starting, of course, with um, sufficient system. Did I saw many of you signing up, right? So did anyone have significant trouble and hasn't reported that in the issue tracker or so? Um, because I think most people have like started to at least re uh, request. I saw about seven requests this morning, just approve them. So if you have requested, for example, last night or uh, yesterday in general, um, just, just try to log in again and see how it goes. I saw we have four submissions already. Yay. So that's how nice it can be. Just submit and forget. Well, don't forget because there's the commenting section. Once you actually completed your assignment, you can still fill in what you didn't kind of do or did do or whatever else. But also bear in mind, there's this readme. You can also, of course, uh, or should, in fact, always pro uh, provide more detail in the README file, right? As part of your professionalism, to kind of see how it's linked, and also, um, you know, link back to the assignment. So, in case you are borrowing, you don't want to rewrite the whole specification. You say, "Hey, that is largely corresponds to assignment C here, and that's what I did, so what I didn't do, or something like this." Or have a look here. Um, I need to make certain choices, and of course, you need to. Um, that's that's part of the idea. So, in the last session, uh, what did we do last session? <laughs> My amnesia sets in. I'm slightly older than you guys, so I may well have forgotten what we talked about last uh, time. What did we talk about? Please. I think we discussed REST methods. Yeah, a bit, right? So we look at um, a REST a bit, exactly more like the practical side. And um, have you heard by anyone about the best practices in designing REST services, REST APIs? Now it's hard for me. That's this this fifty percent thing. Is it a yes? Is it a no? It's a boolean question, guys. <laughs> it's not my left and right, you know. So uh, let's make this probabilistically. I sense the no. <laughs> Did you hear about that? No, right? Okay, that's always a good sign to check. Ask you, you know, uh, your teaching team. They will know whether it was part of the topics list. So I don't think you have talked about it yet. And this goes slightly actually beyond what you need for the assignment, but it picks up. On one of the points we made last time, very practical ones, you know, how to deal, for example, with unimplemented endpoints and how to, how to deal um, or how to provide conveniences uh, um, for the user. Because I was last night thinking about it and kind of when you define, define um, a REST service, you need to be a bit kind of a bit of a, uh, you know, kind of a bipolar thinking in a way. And that means on the one hand, or what, what do I mean with this? Does anyone pick up on what I mean with this? It's a very unconventional way of expressing it, I agree. And that's not an exam question, it's more like a basis for exploration. Every time I'm desperately turning to my teaching team, it means I'm expecting answers from you guys. Um, so no, what I mean with this is like you need to uh, take two per perspective into account, probably more carefully. Well, not more, that's, that's a bit of a stretch, but uh, you know, um, especially if you're developing APIs, uh, you're really working on a specification on a skeleton that people on the one hand use and that you on the other hand feed with data, right? So how does it work as an interface that uh, links whatever data sources you have in whatever type, different media forms, pictures, structures, unstructures, who knows? And you feed it in a unified way, unified interface to someone who uses this on their, in their application and likely not 
as an end user, but also as a developer, right? So you have a very different perspective there. And what I mean by product is like, on the one hand, you need to think about it from a designer point of view, how you design your API to kind of best represent your data, right? Which the other user kind of, because an interface is also an abstraction, will not know about, right? So you're hiding the details. And I'm not sure if you might have talked about it, but the idea is to kind of uh, obscure internals by an API because you want to have a uniform, clean, and long-lasting interface, right? The less details in practice you provide about an interface, the less are you tied to it in the future, right? You have more flexibility in maintaining it, and there's less, less features to support. So it's also about simplicity from, from the other hand. And you see this uh, from the APIs you likely have used, the countries one and the currency one, they, they are kind of you get down to it kind of simple, right? They just reformat data and then dump them to you in a way. But uh, there's only those few endpoints you kind of really need to ideally deal with. So um, this is one side. The other side is dealing with the user. The user doesn't know the internals. So what they likely do is precisely how those uh, uh, websites look like. They poke around the API. They know the endpoints and say, OK, let's just send a get request, see what happens. Who didn't do that? Well, I bet all you tried it, right? So using Postman or whatever else, or the browser just pointing at UL, see what I get, right? And that's how people approach it. They're not reading the documentation first, the ones, the one that you so carefully craft and write. <laughs> but they only look at it if they don't know their way further anymore, right? So to some extent, your API should also be have a bit of a self-documenting um, role, actually, right? By providing the necessary uh, details out of the box or necessarily. Uh, understanding out of the um, box and support the user uh, in as far as sensible. So you want to think about the user of your API to some extent as someone who is uh, 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 needs some um, support and they will not, all, not necessarily always use the API in your intended way and you don't even quite know how they use it because they may use it in a in a completely different context you will have never anticipated and that, so their thinking may also be framed by this. Um, and that brings me to um, to, to, to some general principles on the one hand, but also considerations on the user part. General principles means, you know, what are best practices uh, when, we, when we use REST? REST for now is just a specification, right? There's methods, they have certain properties in their terms of behavior, but the specification doesn't prescribe you how necessarily a path should look like, right? So how you should structure the API, right? In terms of its layout, how much complexity you put in the data structure. It just says, oh, well, there's a body, cool, okay, nice. It doesn't even prescribe that the body's in JSON, right? So, I mean, that's like completely loose. You could serve comp something completely else there. And uh, um, so, but it's good to kind of think about conventions to do this because the REST communities are, um, every time you have something that's a standard that's reasonably simple to adopt, guess what? It gets adopted quite quickly and by quite a diverse crowd, right? And that means people use it very idiomatic. That means in the intended way. And some people in a very non idiomatic way, right? So it suddenly gets this code specification gets a bit of a smell that it's like, oh, just wrong, it doesn't work, or something like this. Just based on the APIs you observed, you get the impression that the entire specification is off only because it didn't over specify but under specify to some extent. So, so but that's um, the same for every technology. You have a technology coming about and then kind of rules of use or rules in use kind of shaping over time conventions, best practices, right? Um, you know that, for example, perhaps from design patterns and orient object orientation, right? Those are not something that was developed in theory. They all came out of practice, right? So the concept of object orientation is a very theoretical one in principle, but everything, how you approach it, whether to use singletons or not, or, uh, you know, other patterns uh, in particular communities, game programmers, for example, have a rich set of additional patterns that application developers often don't draw on they all come out of practice and that's very much the same in rest services as well so i want to take this session to just talk about some of those principles and they will uh, to some extent relate to what we talked about here already in terms of endpoints and, and, and status codes and so on but more generally i think they will um, look forward to the um, uh, time when you actually start devising your own apis right when you think about okay how do i approach this in the first place now this guy asked me to come up with an api uh, how, how do I do this? Come on, help me a bit, right? So, and that's what this lecture is a bit for. So we're looking uh, quite a bit ahead, admittedly, but um, I think it doesn't hurt because it links what you uh, need to do in this assignment with something you want to do, um, or that will be important, I think, for your future assignments um, um, as well. And it's kind of the, I don't know, the, the, the soft stuff in terms of um, uh, API design, where there's no hard right answer, but we want to have some heuristics of that that could guide you possibly 
of how to approach this, if that makes sense. But anyway, let's say, just have a look at it. So uh, and this, in many respects, um, some, some sort of, of a reflection on the discussion we had in the last session, plus um, following the chat in Discord in particular, because there was an interesting question to that point. And I just want to pick up on this uh, in kind of providing some sort of answer that um, is relevant for everyone. Okay, what could be good principles or what are principles you possibly may have heard about? Uh, you know, when you think about designing a REST API, right now you're just using APIs, but you're also designing one. The point is I kind of give you the API layout already. So there's not much, that, you know, creativity in terms of coming up with the structure, uh, but you're nevertheless implementing it, of course, but eventually you will. But can you think about certain conventions that you perhaps even already inferred that you know about, read about, heard about, you know, is there anything? No wrong, no right. Well, we'll see if it's wrong, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 at this stage, I invite every, every voice because of what brainstorming. Individual thinking encouraged, because uh, as we know, individual thinking uh, is most productive in generating idea, and then the community is good for filtering the ideas later on. So if you have any, something that comes on top of your head, just, uh, Share it, please. Okay. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. That is Monday morning, I think, <laughs> in terms of the. Yeah, um, is there anyone on the chat? Yeah. So, cool. um, is there something? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what's the comment? Uh, being able to run and use it for Linux in the Very good. Okay, so that's one. The one good naming, good documentation. Okay. So the first one was about you know having an interoperable API. That means uh, working with. Uh, just get back to that one. What does working with running on or using from? Uh, just use it for Linux Windows. Right. Run and use. So I I, um, I run and use. Okay. So there's this development side uh, that you say, hey, ideally, if I develop an API and have of course the necessary data sources, I want to be able to run on any platform. That's kind of more like a deployment problem, right? Because if you assume that an API is and oftentimes it is proprietary, meaning you own it because you make money with this. This is actually a product, right? So you're not creating user interface like Facebook or else that kind of find a way of getting money, but you actually charge by subscription for using that particular API. So it kind of doesn't matter where it's running as long because you're likely running it. So that may not be the problem, but what will be important unless, you know, there are ideals, but um, this is not as relevant, but I think the usage side is important, right? That it works from Windows, Linux and so on. But this is largely solved on programming language level, realistically, right? So if you have uh, a programming language that supports, uh, you know, REST functionality uh, from a client side, you should be good whatever the infrastructure is. That's kind of, kind of comes of out of the box in as far as REST is concerned, because it sits on HTTP on application uh, protocol level, right? It's very, very high in the stack. Uh, and basically, I mean, in, effectively, it's merely browser technology. So if you can run a browser, you should be able to um, uh, perform that um, as well. The other point was? Good naming, good documentation. Yes, so good, yeah, good naming, good documentation. But that's true for every program you're writing, isn't it, right? <laughs> Well-structured, modularized, good structure, documentation, perfect, right? So you get your A. Um, sure, OK. But how does it look like in practice? Let's put a finger on it. What is that? Anyone, please. I mean, that is also food for you, hopefully, to reflect. Well, then, okay. Well, anyway, we're start, so first of all, those are all right answers. They're all good, um, but they're not specific to REST. They are more general in terms of uh, all forms of um, software development. But I think it's true for APIs, um, documentation plays a particular role because you kind of People need to learn this thing. It's not just looking at the UI and intuitively getting your way around. You kind of need to know how the paths look like, what the responses look like, what the requests look like, status codes look like, all that kind of stuff I gave you for free in the assignment, right? So um, I, I guess um, the best thing to, to kind of discuss this or to iterate over this is go to back to basics. What is REST about? What, was, what does the REST stand for again? Again, amnesia here. What does REST stand for? That's a nice exam question. Uh, it's not a nice because it's an open book one. That's, that's a Google question. It's not a good one. But what does REST? Can you just repeat it? Relational state transfer. Yes, that's right. Representational state transfer. What 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 does it mean actually? Why do we waste time on that? Representational state transfer. That's an exam question though. Yeah, 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 that's good. Cool. In fact, in practice, that's all that matters anyway. No, what was that about? Well, the representational state transfer was really like, 
the, the data as they're written and held on the server are also transferred in the same way, right? So if you think about SQL, you're sending a select statement, right? And But you're not kind of sending the data and say, hey, this is how the data should look like. But in REST, you do that. You literally say, hey, that's my resource. I want you to save it exactly that way on the server, right? And give me an identifier so I can request it again. That's all that stuff. So, uh, you know, so that, that's, that's um, you, you don't have a variation in representation. That's why representational state transfer. I'm just repeating this so it will sink in over time, I, I bet. Um, so, but the point is, uh, um, it's, it's kind of centered around resources, right? We standardize methods, right? We have CRUD, you're exactly uh, spot on, right? We have CRUD plus X, there are certain variations. We, we briefly iterate over them again, but uh, at the center are resources, and that's the way you want to think about it as well. So it's always about, you know, endpoints are a representative or, or um, an abstraction over resources that are managing. Students, currencies, exchange rates, uh, books, articles. You know, always some sort of entities, yeah, but never actions. That's the main point here, right? And the resources, they need to be first order elements. What does that mean? Hey, God. Okay, if your service, for example, um, is um, um, if your service, for example, is managing uh, um, students, right? So, um, and you are only interested in students, but their students possibly also have. Um, I don't know, addresses possibly, right? So where, where they live and so on. In an SQL world, you will quickly incline to think, ah, hang on, addresses, that sounds like something I can standardize and kind of, you know, uh, normalize my way through and represent elsewhere in a, in, in a re relational form, a dedicated table and so on, right? Especially if, you're, if there's repetition and so on. Um, and that may well be the case, even in the back end and REST, that's perfectly fine. But in the REST structure, it means the addresses, if you don't query by address, address doesn't really matter from a REST perspective. So this would not be a first order element, but it would still be contained as a property of a student, for example. But you may not necessarily have a endpoint that says, you know, REST service slash address, and then get all students per address, right? So this would then not be a first order element. The idea is to identify what am I, what are the core entities that my service is interested in, right? In, in for example, the assignment service, that's relatively straightforward, right? What, what are the core entities we're interested in? Just put it out there, it doesn't hurt. No punishment, no worries. Not today, for once. No? Well, you know, what, what, what do the endpoints do? Do they serve multiple? Yeah, please. Currency and currency. It's kind of exchange rates, right? Linked to particular entities, but fundamentally all exchange rates for, for example, a given country in the Bay, no bordering countries, for example, right? So this is kind of the core entity you're interested in. You're not interested in population of the country. You're not interested in the flag color of the country uh, or the telephone prefix. Or even if you wanted to, there could still be properties, but you would never query by or possibly not query by them. Could, and if you did, then they become first order and elements, right? And become relevant. And you see this also in the APIs you're actually using. They have a lot of different, I mean, if you have, if anyone has, has taken time to look at the rest countries one, it's actually quite beautiful in terms of resourcefulness, like you have everything in there, right? So I think even capital, country name, different languages, uh, uh, telephone prefix and all that kind of jazz, but you can't query by many of those. Those are just properties that exist alongside an entity, a resource, yeah? That's why I want you to think about it. Think about something that has you know, in, 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 in SQL sense or in a relational sense, because you're here in databases right now, it would be something that has an own table, basically, right? And a primary key attached to it and something that doesn't. And the same distinction is something we need to make here as well. But the difference is we expose this resource via the URL, right? So we don't think about how it's represented on the back end. It may be relational, maybe a NoSQL database, MongoDB, maybe a flat file, maybe held in memory that someone writes down to paper. Who knows? It doesn't matter as long as it's served uh, along those endpoints, right? So, so resources have kind of data, of course, like content attached to it. They have multiple properties, possibly, and they also have relationships to other things, possibly, even to other first order entities, right? But it's important to identify those first when you design. So don't overdo your API and think, oh, I need endpoints for this and this and this, this, because it matters somehow, or possibly, or perhaps. Your API needs to have a distinct or a set of distinctive purposes um, that you want to organize it, is it by. So that's the first thing you want to get. Uh, uh, be, be clear about. And uh, the other thing, there should be somewhat self-explanatory is probably not the point, probably self-descriptive is the point. So if I'm having an API that's called, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, host slash students, what kind of resource do I expect to get when I call that on? Students, right? So not currencies, not their student grades, not their addresses. Sure, perhaps as a property of a student, but fundamentally you want to have a structure that represents what a student means in the context of my system, right? So that's what I mean with self-explanatory. The URLs need to make intuitive sense. That's why you guys are so keen to say, hey, I just poke this into my browser and see what comes out because I expect the latest history of currency ex you know, uh, exchange rates as existing in the system, right? So that's the intuition. And that's exactly what part of REST is about as well. You should be able to explore it without you know, digging deep in the in, in, in a documentation because there is technically no standard for the documentation. It's kind of, you expect it to be there, but it's not like built into the specification. So if that's not the case, you kind of need to expect that you find a way of exploring it uh, yourself. So your URLs should be um, descriptive. They should mean uh, or reflect the resource that's underlying it effectively. And then, of course, the whole manipulation biz business is basically done using the fixed CRUD methods, right? That we have, you know, with some variations, but fundamentally exactly right. So don't encode functionality in the URL. The functionality is always on the resource, right? So everything in the URL is always a noun, not a verb. That's one of the main points um, that that is to be uh, considered. Please. Oh yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm using that a bit. Sorry for that. I always thought you would you prefer to see my face as opposed to the screen, but I was wrong. So I'm I stand corrected here. All right. Does it make more sense? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm waving a bit around here. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to, of course, share the slide set afterwards. You can retrace what I'm doing. Ah, am I not sharing my screen, right? I'm not a nice person. I'm sharing myself. That's right. I'm super sorry for that. I hope for forgiveness. Let's see if I get it. Uh, I should have scared the screen. I just want to um, perhaps I'll just go back for the for the crowd that has been on the um, stream. That's what I showed just before, basically just outlining the different, uh, uh, you know, what resources are, the self-explanatory nature of it, and of course the focus on methods, particular when it's about manipulation. That's the things we talked about. So um, I'm sorry for that again. Um, so then we have the rest methods, of course. That 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 uh, just to iterate over it again, um, just to be clear. Uh, I want you to be, apart from the missing parentheses here, I want you to be clear about the difference between put and patch, right? Nice exam question, in principle. I really should do oral exams. That's much more, uh, then I can be much more pokey and so on. But, you know, in an open book setting, and likely that's what's going to happen, by the way, you will have a take-home exam, likely, because, you know, we're anticipating the fact that we can't hold it physically again. So that also means that I can't keep you from using the internet and other things. So I need to be, like, super creative for figuring out how to grade this. Um, but it also means that you can look up that stuff. But I still want you to internalize that there's a difference between put and uh, patch. What was the difference again? It's written there, but I just check if you can read the slides. But there's like a, like a if it's not there, it just creates it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's that, that's the intuition actually. So. You, state, say you send a representation, that's how I want the resource to look like to the server, right? Using put, right? What will put do? Well, you check, okay, is there a resource with the same identifier? Let's say student ID, right? If there's one, replace it, right? If there's none, create it, right? In the patch case, it says, does the same thing fundamentally. Okay, this is the uh, representation of the student, student ID and so on. If it doesn't exist, what's happening? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if it doesn't exist, it does nothing. If it exists, it overrides. So semantics are very aligned, but different. That's a nice way of abusing them as well, because you can have a very cheap uh, post <laughs> if you want. Uh, if you want. So, but so just to be, be be clear about, because the rest is super clear in terms of its semantics, even intuitively. That one is not super self-descriptive. Um, anyway, okay, cool. So. Yeah, I wanted to get back to the, the um, URLs. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, first, yeah, make, make this argument first before I get back to the rest, uh, different best structures uh, as well. I just want to give you an highlight or uh, an overview practically what means a good path and a bad path, right? So just to get be clear about it. So, for example, here's an example of a very bad uh, URL, the first one, right? So example, .no get history. Why is it bad? 
I was inclined to look to the left because I expect students to be there. Please, yeah. In, that, that, that is to some extent a good point because it, I made the assumption to talk, think about, <laughs> that's right, I got, yeah, example history from Norway, apparently, right, given the, the host name. But no, that's right, that's uh, beyond the point. Let's say that's the currency service slash history, similar to the one we're having right now. I think when we can infer that it's possibly our currency. But what's the problem with this URL beyond the, the lack of specificity of the resource? Exactly, right? So the get is the problem, right? There's an action term in there because it basically says the only thing you can do with this endpoint is to kind of get, um, get the information. But what happens if you change that endpoint and allow modification of data, right? Suddenly you have a compatibility problem. First of all, you kind of want to keep that URL, right? Because everyone relies on it already. And then you have another method, let's say worst case put. So you put posts or put or post or something, you post something to get history as an endpoint, which kind of doesn't intuitively make sense, right? It does no longer identify a resource, it identifies an activity. It identifies that, you know, you get the history on this uh, endpoint, whatever that would mean, right? The idea is always to separate between resource and activity, a method, right? That's the point. So don't, not to conflate them. Does that make sense? Yeah? So a, a idiomatic way, and here coming back to your point, history, the response is here to it, right? So the self-descriptiveness is, uh, is, 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 is not, not captured. So, um, and you want to be clear if it's, well, the host is generally not a good indicator because host should and could change, right? You lose your domain name, bad luck. You still want to run your API elsewhere because it's just a matter of change the host name for the client to kind of continue using it. And it should be self-descriptive here. So that's on to your point here uh, that it actually uh, shows very explicitly. Would you guess anything else but it being the history of a currency. No, you shouldn't, right? I mean, if you go as far, then you are probably hyper creative, probably a bit more creative than you should be when using REST APIs in any case, right? And of course, it's not, you know, giving you 100% of the idea, but at least, you know, expecting history of currencies, for example, yeah. And um, if you want to model this with greater specificity, and if you think, for example, that it's not just about the history of all currencies, but a history of a specific currency, let's say Norwegian Krona, you can even identify that one possibly, right? So then it's really drilling down because that's something you observe, of course, with the, with the rates API um, thing that is like a bit over the place and you have some ways of kind of narrowing it down. But um, one way of doing is, um, of course, um, increasing the specificity. I mean, that's just an example that someone intuitive, um, yeah, anyway. But yeah, so that was your point earlier. So I didn't respond to that. Um, Same here, makes sense. Right, so we have a encoding of a activity uh, for a post. It's kind of saying the same thing twice. It says create currency and it uh, operates on currency. It doesn't really um, make sense. And then they have the good, good example, which really uh, singles the endpoint. Anyway, that's a few things to just get out of uh, the idea. So it should be self descriptive. You want to be clear what it means with sufficient specificity where needed. But in any case, without any methods. So you else should not use nouns. Always, always a good pointer. And the other thing is also the nouns or the resources should generally be plural as well. Because likely is that you want to keep the flexibility of managing multiple of the same kind. Right? Multiple currencies, multiple countries, multiple authors, multiple users. If there's an instance where you only have one, sure, then you use single, of course. But by convention, you kind of want to think about uh, it from a uh, or basically a question you want to ask yourself, do you possibly have collections sitting behind it, right? And if it's collections sitting behind it in, in the data, as the data structure, it's actually, it should be a plural. The key thing, however, uh, when you make this call, it should be consistent across the API. So don't change it, make it singular, plural elsewhere and so on. Because people need to be able to, uh, I'm not sure if I should, should even suggest that, but should be able to guess the URLs to some extent if they know what resources you manage, right? If they know your endpoint and you know service name, um, sorry, the, the host and kind of the service name, then they should be able to guess possible endpoints um, as well. Okay. Um, and to my earlier point, it's really about thinking about what the A API is for you, right? So sometimes it's an internal API, AWS, right? They, they, do, they do everything by since when? You, you brought this up, this topic. Since when is, does AWS have everything as API? Uh, 2000. 2002. So, what was the provision exactly? What did they say? Uh, they said that everyone should provide API for 
Okay. All of them are filled out. Right. So the, uh, the internal ones, right? Yes. So right. The yeah. right. So, so what Siamak uh, uh, has mentioned, like there was a provision, I think, by Jeff Bezos, likely, yes. or um, that by in two thousand two, I'm not sure when it was supposed to be realized that every sort of communication between activities or act, uh, you know, some products in a way should work via API. So it's a real a clear expectation that you would have uh, in-house services as well, in addition to external services provided by APIs. And that's the question you need to ask yourself. Whom do you write the API for? Is it for yourself, for convenience? Cool, it may well work fine. And then you get away with a bit more, uh, you know, uh, assumptions about the API because you kind of know the structure, right? We, in uh, software engineering, you had software engineering, right? Please say yes, please say yes. Yeah, they said yes. Um, lucky me. Um, you had, you, did you talk about the difference between um, functional and structural testing? White box versus black box testing? Please say yes, please say yes. Okay, fail. 50%? I'm sitting at 60 because I see no, smiles. We're, we're it <laughs> okay, so, 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 you, you, so um, um, generally in software engineering, you probably talk about testing in general, right? Different forms of testing, like unit testing, uh, integration testing, regression testing, all that business. But there's a second dimension to it. The second dimension is basically um, how you test. And in many instances, for example, in, uh, did Maish talk about testing in Go? We touched up on this, right? So, what kind of testing would that be? Of those types that you know, is it integration testing, unit test, unit, right? So it's really about individual functions or something that you test. You put some input, expect some output, all good and done. So this is what we call refer to as functional testing, right? You don't care how good or bad your implementation is. You just hope that the right things comes out, right? Is it a deterministic function? That means does it produce the same output as the input that I want? Can I test certain boundary values? What happens if I enter a minus one as opposed to one? You know, do you can you provoke errors and things like this? So we just see check the robustness of the function uh, against undesired input or invalid input, in fact. That's the main point, invalid input, we get back to that. And uh, structural testing would be to look at the code, right? So actually turn the, flip the page and look at the inside, see is that, you know, do they use the right forms of collections? Are they correctly initialized? Is there, uh, you know, possibly a memory leak that you may never spot by just running one unit test, right? Because most likely you will not uh, see, uh, observe uh, memory uh, consumption in the first place. So, but structural testing makes, puts an emphasis on this. And here's the kind of same perspective uh, as well. So you need to assume uh, or make assumptions about the knowledge that someone has about the internals of your API, right? And uh, respond to this in, in one way or another. The user, like we in the currency case, we may not know the internals at all. So we need more information about it. And you should then see the API more like an outward facing product. And that means a lot of conveniences on the part of the user and also a lot of forgetfulness, right? So if you think about, for example, uh, this was one question in chat. Um, that I just want to respond to is you want to provide you choose meaningful error codes and messages. Don't just say 400 bad requests. Right? Sure, in some instances you don't have a choice and fall back to that because the request is so bad that it's just and you have no clue as or in, in an automated way to infer what went wrong. Did they forget a bracket in their uh, JSON or you know so that they, they can of course be malformatted uh, content or payload or something like this. But even if you have this. You have, a, for example, a malformatted JSON uh, format, uh, and you identify this as part of your decoding. You can say, "Hey, there's something wrong with your JSON," as opposed to "There's something wrong with your header information in your request." That request is super generic for it, right? So, so be clear about the error code as, as, uh, as far as possible, but also provide some sort of uh, uh, meaningful messages. So, error codes are made for machines; messages are made for humans. No, you shouldn't pass. Um, um, error messages or status messages. Right? If you have 200, okay, you should work on. The, you should use the 200 and assess this, right, in your in your array handling, not the okay, because that may well possibly change because you know, I don't know, some some changes in the next iteration of of, of Golang, but likely they're not changing the status code itself. Right? But if you think about the messages, they're actually meant for the developer to see, you know, how self descriptive is it. If they know something is wrong with my JSON, guess how much faster it will be fixing it. And getting the right, you know, sending a good request next time, right? So it's really um, there's something about testing from a functional perspective here, and also from an intuitive perspective here. Try stuff you shouldn't do with your API as well. And that's why coming back to my bipolar perspective, as developers, we always assume a positivity. That is, everyone uses your 
application and software as intended, right? You always think they click the right button when you expect them to click the right button, right? They're properly close to your program, right? They, uh, you know, always use the right date format when they enter things, right? But you need to assume the opposite in some instances, right? Especially what, what would be, what would be stuff people do when they don't know a REST API? What's the possible thing that people focus on? Engage it. They, they may continuously poke your uh, API, yeah, with random requests, yeah. But what, what, are, what are other problems that people often have? Likely when they think about URLs, what do you get? Are we good at typing URLs? Who of you types URLs regularly? I mean, apart from uh, vg.no or uh, other news sites, but if we talk about, no, right? So we enter it in Google, right? Google does that for us likely, right? So it's like, you know, I mean, 15 years ago, I would have thought that that's only my parents do it this way, but nowadays I'm doing it the same way. So it's kind of weird. But uh, so point is, we're not actually super good in typing. We're not good in typing IP addresses. I think we figured that out, but we're certainly also not too good in typing URLs. And your REST user, for example, assume they get, they misspelled students, right? Students, students, students too, all students, you know, whatever else, get students again. So your API needs to be kind of robust against misuse in that, of that form. Or they forget the students bit entirely and just see what happens, right? Some of you may have tried it actually when just deploying initially, right? So to see what, what, what kind of error do I get, right? Expect the unexpected in a way. That's my, the, the point I'm making. So part of your uh, testing and development should also focus, of course, on the developer side. So how, what's the idiomatic the intended use? And then also perhaps uh, flush your brain. <laughs> <laughs> and then play user. <laughs> and that's best done, in my experience, by having a few days in between. You do something else, different courses, attend to something else, look at your own API, start this thing up again, ideally when you forgot half about it, and just use it from the endpoint perspective and see if you can behave a bit erratically. And then you quickly appreciate what it means to have meaningful error messages, because you actually figure out bad request doesn't help you, because it doesn't mean did something go wrong when you wrote to the, yeah, that shouldn't be, is it like, again, your payload, your header, or where did something go wrong in your in your on your on your server side of course right um but that's will be really useful the other thing is of course we talked about it as well for development purposes it may be very convenient for you to quickly see the stack trace right where did it actually go wrong right so which and which of my error handling um actually you know was was caught here in this particular instance so for this purpose it may often be useful to just say http error and then have error dot error basically sending the error message back to the user which you should of course not do in the production system but here for your development makes you quite be used be quite useful to figure out where your code breaks right just to exemplify this again uh, a bit uh, earlier Hang on. Um, so for example you, you know you have multiple instances where there can be error handling right so every time you have io activity going on dealing with a database, whatever else, then it's very convenient to think about, hey, let me just write back the error, right? So that's exactly what we're doing here, right? Or even a complete stack trace or whatever else. Again, bear in mind, that's not something you want to expose to the user, but that should be meaningful in the context of where it occurs. But the stack trace initially helps you to figure out where errors commonly occur in, in my, my handler, right? So because it's not always the error you, 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 you guess it will be, it may be something else. And it helps you a lot um, to be quick in identifying it, as opposed to uh, looking at it from a server side again, figuring out what is the timestamp and you know, when, when did I invoke it and so on. It can be very tedious. I have experience right now with the, uh, I say with gratitude, with the submission system right now, right? When, uh, because uh, some people indicate already, hey, I got a 500. Yeah, good luck to me, because now I need to figure out when did this person call that service and got the 500 amongst the other 500s that I now found using grep, right? So, um, so it's a quite uh, um, 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 yeah, arduous kind of uh, activity in this instance, but this could be shortcuts. But the important thing is, of course, at the end, it needs to be meaningful um, to the user, of course. Um, yeah, anyway, so that was, that was one of the, the points, it was a bit of a uh, extended uh, um, thought process, but I just want you to be clear here. The status code and the um, status metrics are not the same thing, right? People say, oh, well, you know, I have a status code already. Why do I bother with the other thing? I just put anything in there. I don't care, right? So blah, 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 blah. Here's your status code. Have fun. Uh, your status message. No, no. You want to think about this. And as designers, like API designers, um, 
you want to have both perspective in mind. This one is best done by doing it on a functional site, functional testing. This one is best done as a developer, right? As a developer, you kind of have the certain specificity. You know what went wrong on the server side without being overly specific. Here is what can the user do to alleviate and solve this ultimately, right? So that's more from, from the client user um, perspective. Um, I think, yes. And I talked a bit about, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll just pick up there in, in a bit uh, because we're running uh, closer to, yeah, anyway, let's, let's uh, wait, leave this for after the break. So because nearly 11, so 11.15, we continue. A few more practical concerns uh, regarding REST APIs. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We can pick up on this in uh, 15 minutes. And again, I um, apologies for the late uh, sharing of the slides. I didn't spot that. If that happens again, just uh, post it in the uh, chat and we can um, address this. So let's continue. So I got carried away there every time I'm um, looking at those things. Um, picking up on an easy one, that is really like the, the, the arrow code, um, the status class is just uh, briefly again. Um, the, I mentioned briefly in the last session that there are certain abstractions expressed in the status codes themselves, right? So we have general status code classes, and then we have uh, subtypes within, right? Does everyone recall that? Or, so, so, and that's how I would like you to, to think about it. When you're um, looking at status codes and you want to identify what is it, you know, come up with a more generic class first. Is it like, which three classes are mostly relevant for REST services? Two, four, and five, right? So one is informational, three is about rerouting on, on, on uh, between URLs, for example, and you know, those kind of networking kind of uh, challenges. But when it comes to services like application uh, and, and, and um, code execution status uh, signaling, then 200, 400, 500 is good. 200 sounds good, right? So everything is fine. 400, um, well, it, the pointer is coming back to you. You did something wrong. 500 pointer back to me as an API. I did something wrong and I, May or may not have an idea what it is, right? So, so there's quite a bit of um, um, the, the um, different different codes, and just again to just uh, allude to the overview. Let's see how that goes. Um, briefly, I just want to highlight some, and then highlight the ones that you want to be really mindful of, because I realize that um, they are often confused or sometimes confused. So, and I'm going down the route of using Wikipedia here, so careful here. This is not the primary resource, right? What's the primary resource if we want to figure out something about status codes? Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Sure. Have you seen it? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, hang on, is it in there? It's like this really old, uh, this is this really old, like, meme exactly 2000. Okay. It's all the HTTP. Of course, it's like, cats, right? So, yeah, yeah. I, I should do that next time around. Actually, it motivates it much more nicely. Thanks, Jason. That's a good, uh, good injection. He's pointing to HTTP cats, of course. The basically emotional uh, representation in terms of cat emotions, I guess, uh, as to what those uh, calls represent. Okay, then we go to the middle round. We're not going the crazy RFC round. We're also not going the crazy cats route. We're taking a middle ground. That is Wikipedia. Uh, that means it's human readable, uh, but still information centered. But uh, just to bring it back to the point, uh, this is not the primary resource, right? If you can use Wikipedia because they are reasonably stable, I'm just telling you the official resource you need to, be, you know, will really be sharp and clear about it and want to get a definition for the individual ones. You need to go back to the RFC uh, 7231, right? Don't memorize this, but you know there is an RFC that deals with this stuff. And it should also be linked here. But um, just want to something I just want to go back to because people always think, oh, I need to know the specific error code. No, I don't think so. So what? But you want to need to know is the HTTP status code classes, right? There are those five classes, and you need to figure out which ones you fall under. Then you can use this actually kind of to get it uh, to get it right eventually. And it should also be good heuristic when you design an API to ensure that I at least pick the right classes. And if I don't know anything further, pick the most generic codes, which would be 200, 400, or 500. 400 bad request. Not helpful, but at least I know something, the client did something wrong, even though I can't be more specific and more helpful in, in doing this. But when you look at some of them, um, they're actually quite 
um, um, you know, they become increasingly detailed, right? You have 200 generated, okay, created, accepted. I'm going into the detail. What's the difference between created, accepted? Written there, but we can perhaps by intuition. So what does the 200, 201 feel most applicable to? Which kind of REST method? Yeah, right? it's about created. Oh, yeah, I did something on the server side. Not just, oh, it went well, 200 for a GET request, right? But likely don't want to see a 201 on a GET request because it would mean you manipulated the server somehow just by calling it. That sounds just wrong. Um, so you would expect 200, but you see their specificity is a lot higher because you know something that I know not only something went right, but something has been happening on the server. I know the effect. 202, what's the difference? That maybe like the applicable for its like patch or um, it could, it could be, but that's not the idiomatic, the actual uh, 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 purpose of that one. The argument here for 202 is that, you know, we always think about REST service being like super quick, right? Oh, change a student, change it, right? Whatever. But uh, if you have a sufficiently complex API, it may actually just be, you know, be processed asynchronously, right? You say you want to add a student, but then may actually, like, you know, for example, in our interview registry, I think they only do it once a day or something, right? They have a batch processing, and then they add the new students, change statuses, uh, remove old students, whatever, right? So those those management uh, cycles. And this this basically is, um, you know, uh, speaking to that one. Basically, your request has been accepted, but it may not have been have been executed yet. So if you do an immediate get afterwards, you will not find your new resource eventually, but uh, immediately. But eventually, you'll find it. So that's the asynchronous characterization that is kept up here. So if you have something that actually doesn't do immediate modifications on the database, but queues something, you want to use a two or two, right? Because you say, hey, you know, eventually it will happen. I'm not sure when, uh, and I will also not give you feedback when, but at least you know it's going to happen, right? So that's the that's the key I, um, idea. So two or four is another. Does it make sense? Right? It's just to respect different semantics of the system sitting behind the REST service. Um, two or four, very popular one. No content basically says, you know, everything went right, um, but there's no content in your response to your request, right? So it could also be. Um, uh, you know, instances where you do, for example, um, do a post, right? But you don't giving the user anything back. You can tell the user, well, you know, your request not only has went well, but there is intentionally no content here. It could well be that it sends a 200 back, but you were expecting content in the body, right? For whatever reason. But here it said, don't expect anything happening in the body here, right? So that's, that's the main point, if you want to signal this. And if you walk through this, you can see much more specificity and becomes increasingly, uh, yeah, overly weird and sometimes you really think hey guys what kind of period have you lived in because there's a lot of reference to technology that's by no means used anymore i think i mean web stuff is uh, was quite hot at some time but uh is, is probably not too relevant in practice anymore so again there's this whole uh, redirection thing which is like really more on http level proxying related and uh, indication whether for example url is expired or ui is expired um it's used for redirects conventionally so it's more like something you configure in your domain if you have a domain, for example, that's something way, way, and you have redirections happening there, most likely they use uh, 300 um, um, HTTP codes actually, under the hood, you wouldn't notice, because your browser deals with them. Basically says, hey, this URL is no count anymore, there's a new one, and it does automatically redirect, you just see the target site. So sometimes that's a nice way of dealing with uh, resource expiry. And here, a few other ones. Um, the um, 400s, bad request, we got that one, something can't happen, and it becomes increasingly specific, right? 401, unauthorized, 402, very nice one, payment required, that's cool, I mean, I have never seen that in life, but it's again one of those where they overthought it, I think, in terms of, okay, so now I know that there's payment required, but no one tells me how to pay, I mean, I, I whatever, I mean, that's, that sounds like something you should redirect to a kind of paywall or something like this nowadays, so you probably wouldn't use it for 402 anymore for this. 403 forbidden, 404, oh, you all know that one for, uh, for not found. And this is one you want to know or consider using if you have people poking around your API and they uh, like make up the path, like right? type student in terms of students, right? Or type teachers. I don't know. Perhaps you don't have an endpoint teachers, you want to serve them something, right? And a 404 is a very good one there because 
sorry, doesn't exist. Right? So it's meaningful. 400, you can do that. You just see there's something wrong, but it doesn't tell the user what they got wrong. What should I look at? Did they perhaps the JSON the body wrong or did I get the URL wrong? 404 makes it very clear. They got the URL wrong, right? So um, that's the idea to think about. Do you, does any one of you know kind of a funny code in the 400 uh, class or any, any code that's right, somewhat unconventional akin to the HTTP cats? Yes, what is that about? Some like T, okay, that's about there, that's right. So that's actually a fun code, it's created on Easter egg that has sneaked in there over years. It's um, 418, I'm a teapot. That was actually an Easter egg uh, <laughs> implemented there, edit. It's not meant to be used, but it's actually, you know, reference to this, uh, I guess, the geeky culture uh, around the um, specification of this uh, one in particular. And the idea is basically is an April Fool's jokes from an ITF. Uh, and the original idea was to, uh, that was basically a response code by um, IoT style teapots that would signal that they're actually doing tea or whatever they're doing, uh, actually. So it, it's not meant to be used, it's just a fun one to know about and possibly abused in one way or another. Um, in fact, they even invented a protocol around, uh, around it, which is called the Hypertext Coffee Pot Control protocol. Um, you see there's a weird community around it. Anyway, 418, so it's not all uh, treated to be treated with entire, um, you know, uh, all too serious, but uh, there are some of those, those stones in there. But there's a lot of other ones that are interesting as well, right? So for example, that's the payload is too large, too much stuff delivered. You, you, you requested a media type picture, let's say, or audio file or video, and it's just too far large for an HTTP request. So basically it says, you did everything right, but sorry, we can't deliver your resource for whatever particular reason there. Or you are too long and so on. Unsupported media type. We go to the media types briefly as well. So you see the 400 range is quite, quite uh, wide. And I encourage you when you think about, and it was my intent, uh, uh, um, uh, designing your API and also for assignment one, creating your API, think about using the arrow codes as appropriate as possible, right? Getting the class about right is good, 400, 200, 500, but being more specific, where useful and helpful, not overdoing it, not forcefully say, ah, I need to find something else but 400 right now. Uh, but if you feel like I can't help, you know, I can't provide any more like in instruction that is meaningful and that corresponds uh, um, to, to the, what the user did, then you know, stick with the 400, of course. But uh, if you can, uh, do it this way. So it's a kind of two-step approach, identifying the class and then the most appropriate uh, error. Other one is 500. I'm really personally not a big fan. This is the most common one, of course, the 500 itself. Something went wrong in the server. Well, good luck, right? So it's like, it doesn't tell me really, really, really much, right? So um, there's really not much to go for in many respects. But I think at least recognizing the uh, we talked about exactly that one last time, not implemented, right? If you have an endpoint that you haven't done yet or you haven't finished yet, even if you don't manage it for the assignment to finish it, just put the not implemented there, right? So you have the endpoint defined and you kind of didn't do the diag thing or whatever else, doesn't matter, but at least you thought about it. It says that's the, how the intended API should look like as opposed to 404, which means it doesn't exist. I couldn't be bothered doing it or something, right? So um, there, there's a nice way of dealing with uh, incremental development uh, amongst many other ones, but I think they're not as relevant in our practice uh, timeouts, that's something more that related to uh, if you have an intermittent gateway, which we don't deal with right now, or bad gateway or whatever. I think 501 and 500 are quite um, useful. So anyway, um, I, I didn't, I don't want to, my intent was not to go too deep in it, but just to motivate that there's actually distinctions um, between those in a two-way um, um, fashion. Cool. Um, right. So... Ah, yeah, yeah. What's the difference between 401 and 403? 401 was not authenticated, 403 forbidden. What's the difference? Is there any difference? That's usually confused. That's why I'm asking. Like people do one or the other or both, or I don't know, or randomly pick them. Perhaps you can randomly pick, who knows? Any comments there? Yeah. No. So um, there's basically a place with the differentiation between authentication. Ah, there's something. I saw a thing somewhere. Uh, not locked in. Phone was locked in, but I can not Correct. That's exactly right. So it's the difference between authentication and authorization, right? Did you hear that somewhere in some course? Which course was it? Or did you just know that part? I just want to know where it comes from because that's usually taught somewhere and it can in some security course often. Sorry? Cyber? Yeah, 
cybersecurity, or that's very likely. Exactly, it's classically a security problem where they separate with three, between three different things: um, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Right, accounting of what the user does in the system, so you can log it. Um, also, authentication. You know, is the user recognize the system in the first place? That's your FIDO login, basically saying, okay, are you logged in or not? Right? You know, do you have an erroneous login? And then authorization looks at your permission set. What are you allowed to do? So all of you, for example, uh, signed up for the permission system. So authentication, all ticked. But not all of you have the teacher's view <laughs> in the system, luckily for me. Um, so you not necessarily have the full authorization in all instances, right? So those are two distinct things. And you want to differentiate depending on your API, you know, especially if it requires user authentication. It doesn't really. But uh, in, your, in your, you know, professional practice, you want to differentiate between those two ones. So just be clear about, um, um, yeah, how that works. The other one we talked about, the, the implementation challenge, um, should be 501 as well. We talked about the 201 with 202, 201 being something's created as opposed to accepted for creation. That's this uh, offloading in the, in, the, um, in the use. So the idea is basically there. If you have um, um, something be as specific as sensible, right? For post requests, created is often good return code. For get put, post push and patch, uh, put and patch, 200 is good. For deletes, no content is pretty good. You delete the resource, but well, don't expect any sort of feedback anymore from here on, right? So um, that's, that's kind of the signal. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to get this um, back. Last point, uh, data formats. Um, it's also important to think about, or not the last point, but one of the important points is um, data formats. So plain text is, of course, something you can provide, but plain text is often not really nicely uh, processable by um, machines, right? So, I mean, you know, you want to have it in some sort of semi-structured form. Um, and that's okay, of course, for simple things like, you know, if you don't have a, especially for error uh, status messages and so on, I think that's okay uh, getting away with this. But um, for anything that's slightly more complex or stand, uh, structured, think about what, you know, some sort of standardized output format. You can even do it for errors. Um, if you devise, there's no standard format per se, but if you devise a standard format for errors, you mean you have always, um, you know, timestamp, uh, perhaps um, ID associated with this issue. That's actually quite cool if you provide a unique identifier for a particular error and lock this on the server side. And it's super quick from a grab perspective. If someone sends you an email like you guys and we don't have this implemented, bad luck. It would be really cool because then you would just send me the ID and I could just grab and find the ID of the respective check trace on the server side and figure out what went wrong, right? So that's something you could standardize quite nicely, and uh, but you would need to kind of have a standardized error output. But in our case, I think for now, we're pretty, pretty much good with, you know, you just writing something into the body that signals what went wrong or right or whatever else in as far uh, as relevant. But that's something where you want to be somewhat creative, but error on the side of um, structured output. So especially if you have a standardized output, you want for every error. And it's also helpful if you have a diverse set of developers. Think about the you know, group team. If you know this is our error output format, guess what? They always need to think about this unique identifier. They always need to think about the message. They always need to think about a timestamp, right? So it's not like you have a divergent in structure in the end. And then also you can possibly then easily template it and put a UI over it in the end. So then you have, you know, have a nice representation of it as well and because you have the structured information. So it may be worthwhile investing into this, especially if you have some, you know, an extended API that you want to maintain and run in the, for the long haul um, to some extent. Classical formats is of course JSON, I guess, especially for this rather uh, simple um, things, but there are other formats as well. Did anyone of you hear about XML? Yes, right? So uh, like it or hate it? <laughs> it's only so those two ones. Or is it just for dinosaurs? It's also an answer. I often hear that one. Uh, okay, well, you know, it has certain different properties. I'm not going into this one, uh, but it's actually more for document uh, um, uh, structure. So it has a tree structure principle, whereas uh, JSON has a more like the map collection style uh, structure. So it's actually meant more to be much more lean and efficient JSON. But when it comes really complex, you will quickly see the payoff of having um, XML because of you know features like cross-referencing within you know something like you know from books. Think about books a bit, and you see you know much more nested structures, right? And there's linkages between those. And that's where JSON just becomes messy. You can do it. You can all do all of that. It's just super messy suddenly. How to link elements because you don't have unique identifiers necessarily in the documentation format. But for example, in, in XML, you have built-in attributes. You can say this item has a unique identifier throughout the entire document of 
whatever else, as opposed to making it up on the fly as a key in map structure and based. And then there's YAML. YAML is more like working based on, we'll see YAML again. Um, we'll see YAML again in uh, Docker context of Docker, Docker Compose in particular, um, because Docker Compose files are um, YAML files, actually. So we'll come back to that one, can dig in a bit more at that time. Okay. Um, so the other thing is the content type. We didn't really talk about it because you only deal with one content type in this uh, large part of the course, but I actually encourage you to kind of go beyond this as well. Uh, do you know other content types uh, than the one we used? CSV. Yeah, that's right. What else? What's the content type we're using right now anyway? What's this called formally? Like what, what's the so-called MIME type? But you're not a trick. So we use JSON, right? right? So how do we indicate this in our uh, REST headers that we return JSON or request JSON? Anyone? In the header? Yeah. In the header. In the header, that's cool. Yeah, we write application JSON. Do you recall that? I mean, don't just write JSON. It would be a lot easier. Why do we do this application business, right? It doesn't help, right? So, um, because those internet people, they were thinking about being clever again. Of course, we have endless num number of different headers uh, for, for very different purposes. Uh, we, you know, we talk about user agent being the browser, content type, that's the one you want to be attentive to, content language, if you're interested in it, uh, character set date, um, and so on. Okay, so with try information, you can also have a custom headers, but I want to want to get it is the content types, of course, and they are separated into different, guess what, classes again, right? So uh, like similar to our HTTP status codes, where we have 100 to 500, we have here different top level media types that are have been devised in 1996, I believe. So that was one time ago. Again, you see in the timeliness of and the incremental progression here of text, image, audio, video, application, and then there's multi-part in message. So, so and the idea is basically that at that time, one, they were trying to categorize all kind of information that would possibly be shared, via REST or otherwise, uh, in, in uh, using those generic types. Either you have a text format, and text, the idea is there that is generally human readable. Like if you have, you know, a novel by uh, uh, Torbjörn Egner or something like this, right? So that could be something that would be expressed as text format, basically, right? If you're an image of, let's say, a cat, uh, guess what? It's an image one video, you know, and so on. You, you get the gist. So, and then within those, we have all those different sub formats that exist. For example, we have text, which could just be uh, text plain. That is literally just, you know, novel text, whatever else. We could also have um, text XML. So XML oftentimes has the encoding text XML. Um, and so on. And similar, for example, for images, we have image JPEG. Well, guess what? We know it's a JPEG format and we, we know, of course, know it's an image, right? But uh, specifically, it's a JPEG as opposed to PNG, for example, format, video, including encoding and so on. So every time you read this here, it's not a um, fixed kind of, you know, um, a string that specifies only a video or whatever else. It's always a decomposition of, on the one hand, the overall type, the MIME type, and then the specific subtype in there. So it's similar to the status course. You can read it or think about it similarly. And then there is, of course, application. And application is basically borderline between, um, or, or the, the way I treat it, it's like, uh, it could be, of course, binary data, but in any case, it should not be human readable. So that's data that's generally not human readable. Unfortunately, someone thought that JSON is not human readable. Um, well, I, I kind of sensibly disagree in many instances, more readable than clear text, but it can, of course, be borderline if it becomes too complicated, and then it's clearly on that side. But by convention for JSON, you will likely use the application JSON. That's why it's categorized there, uh, whereas XML is often categorized as text XML, but that's often much more complicated to read if you recall your exposure to XML than actually JSON. So that should also be application XML. Uh, well, anyway, so it's messy, um, but you see where it's coming from, right? So if you have application specific data or complex data, uh, use the application prefix, even though it's textual. If it's any kind of sort of media format that's non-textual, then uh, find the corresponding uh, super type as well. Here's the stuff multi-part and message. What is that made for? Does anyone know? I bet you have come across this in your life. Did you ever get the partial email or something? 
lucky you, you probably use better email clients than I do. Um, but you know, so if, if an email becomes, you know, overly large, it's actually chunked up into, you know, um, different parts effectively and re and then sent over the network and basically and recombined in your, in your client appears as one again, right? So in some time it goes sideways, you lose one part of the email if you wanted to, for example, and then you have a broken kind of email if you like. And this is what this format is for. It's basically all splitting up uh, media files. And you can imagine that for videos, that would have been a very attractive way of doing this, right? Chopping it up. If it's, you know, if you have megabytes and you want to kind of allow users to download parts of it or whatever, this would be a format as well, where you basically specify, you know, this is uh, part one and so and so, and it ranges from here to there. So that on the client side, on the receiver side means you can, you know, patch those all back together into one binary. And then likely it's, uh, you know, uh, a regular video again. But anyway, that's the idea. That's mostly done for uh, emails at that time. Um, in, in any case. So, um, yeah, take into account any sort of transmitted data and it just has been kind of found its way into uh, REST as well. That's why it's not surprising that this one is from 1996, but it's nevertheless adopted in something that's a specification that is um, as recent as um, 2014 in its latest iteration in any case. Okay, um, okay, I think we got, there, there, there's some, <laughs> There's always more, and I leave you, of course, with the resources um, to kind of uh, look it up again and, and check and reflect. And some of them go well beyond what we need in the course, so it's really more for your professional practice to kind of think about when you think rest. What you know are the aspects I actually need to think about? What alternatives exist? Because you are not just you know um, implementing implementing something that someone provides you in terms of specifications, but you actually have a design role as well, right? So, and that will increase throughout the course. Right now, I gave you kind of ninety percent of what you need for the assignment. And it will be less and less and less, and you need to think about it more and more and more. So that's the, that's what happens. And it happens also through, throughout your degree, right? So the first year, you get a lot of stuff given, yet you're actually doing working off. Second year becomes more on par, and third year is kind of a bit on you, right? So bachelor projects, so it's something, oh, here's the problem, go for it, good luck, right? So you learn enough to do this. And that's, that's this kind of um, um, trade-off that we are kind of having here as well. So you're becoming more and more designers in a developer sense um, as opposed to, um, um, you know, um, only executor. Okay, so when you, just, just one thing which people uh, don't think about comprehensively, and I think it comes across in the assignment specification is um, when you think about um, the, the, the structure, especially in, in terms of documentation, but also in terms of um, designing an application, um, sorry, a, a REST API in particular, there are certain elements you always want to bear in mind. And just, I'm just explicitly calling them out uh, here, right? So a request or response specification always consists of a URL or UI, right? The kind of resource you want to point to and operate on, right? Uh, then it always it consists also of a content type header. And for example, in the context of a post request, it means that's the kind of um, content that I'm um, providing as part of the body, right, student representation. Get request is also what is FI, what you receive as part of the body, so it kind of signals what is uh, embedded there. Then, of course, the body itself. So in some instances, you will have a body in your message. In some instances, you won't. For example, in a get request, you don't have a, in a request, you don't have a body, right, because you're just saying, hey, I want this resource, whatever, and the response deals with the body, right. And then, of course, the corresponding status codes and messages. Think about those four items every time you're, you're doing a request because it's easy to forget that one here. Yeah? And you get, you get it about right because, you know, the system and, and Golang is very permissive in inferring, um, you know, in browsers anyway, uh, very much so, in inferring that's, for example, JSON, but it's just good practice to be consistent about it. That's why I'm calling it out here um, as well. So always those four elements. I need to see how that correspondingly looks on the response side, right? In post, you of course have a body. In response to a post, you likely don't have a body, right? So, or you may have a body, but uh, uh, it's not mandatory. But for a post, it's certainly um, the case. And here, this is actually taken from Wikipedia. So that's basically just a nice uh, visual collation of the uh, characteristics uh, from the RFC. You see the reference there um, throughout. But how it looks like, right? So, you know, the question as to whether uh, re the request has a body, the response has a body. Um, whether it's item potent, which is a kind of um, um, a good point, item potent, what does that mean? We talked about this. I need you sitting here. Item potent basically means can, can you send the same request and you have the same effect on the server? Or do you, if you send the same, exactly the same request, 
do you, does it lead to a different outcome on the server, right? So uh, obviously, for example, um, when you send a GET request, you're requesting the same results five times, 10 times, 11, it's always the same thing happening, right? Server going to the database, fetching the student, returning to you, right? No changes, no manipulation. For post, quite a bit of difference, right? So if you post the same student five times, it's not the same effect because suddenly you have five students of different IDs, right? You create five new entities. So those would be considered uh, a request you need to be more conscious about, mindful about. Get requests are for kind of for free in that sense because they don't have an effect on the server. And it also means they're in principle cacheable. You expect the same student again. On the client side, your browser can say, hey, I can cache this. So I don't need to fetch it actually from the server. You, you save data, save transmission and so on. So it's important because the browser or your client can know this and can work accordingly, right? So if you have multiple GET requests of the same time, it may actually draw on the cache by knowing from a specification that you're allowed to cache it, right? Whereas, um, yeah, so where that may not always be the, the case in other um, instances. So for example, put or delete should not be cached, should never be cached, right? So that's the kind of um, idea. So anyway, this kind of collates a bit some of the points that I'm making, but of course not all of them, but more importantly, like, you know, where do you have a body, where the body is optional, where you don't have a body. Uh, for, for example, I mean, the head one is the obvious one, where you send a head request, your response by definition doesn't have a body, right? So where in other cases actually can have a, or has a body. Okay. So anyway, Okay, um, well, of course, you want to, in terms of the, 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 the practice supporting the user, we talked a bit about the documentation idea. So when, um, how is that relevant? Well, for example, you want to provide an explicit specification of all the requests and response types you're getting in terms of their internal structure, right? UI, status code, uh, content type, um, you know, perhaps even, you know, structure of the body, usually it's really good to work by example. I mean, especially REST adoption hinders on the availability of the examples. And we, I, so far, I've been trying to uh, find APIs that have examples, <laughs> as opposed to APIs that don't, which in a way you need to figure it out yourself. But um, mind you, there's a lot of, of them out there where you just get an endpoint, you need to explore the rest on your own. So um, if, if, if that is your product, uh, you better want to kind of have a good specification. I mean, uh, in, in some instances, you can have a formal specification. There's something like a uh, JSON schema uh, that allows you to formally specify the types as well, uh, but for the purpose of adoption uh, practice, um, examples just make the better point. Uh, and uh, always provide an example for input and output, right? So that people know what to expect, but also know what to send, not just one of them, because that's just not helping um, as well. And uh, where can, where possible, even errors, like typical gotchas. Don't do the following because it will yield the following, right? So um, where you can anticipate it. This is again where this bipolar perspective comes in, where you look at it from a user side that has no priors, doesn't know about the internals and just try to poke your API, including typos and all that kind of jazz. You'll have noticed already, and I think Maj talked about it, it's a really important one, if you get the, uh, omit the um, trailing slash on URIs, um, then Golang, the Golang router by default kind of converts it to get request, even though it's a different request, right? It's a post request, but if a guest providing the slash at the end, uh, in, 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 in your UI, it actually will convert it to get request, but common issue that you'll find when we get to assignment two. Not now, because everything is get requests. Um, but yeah, so it's something you want to test for as well. Um, cool. So yeah, one uh, aspect I just wanted to, um, so let's see. The, the other aspect that this one briefly allude to is the uh, idea of uh, nested um, structure. It's not something we'll, we'll, we'll um, necessarily find um, often, and that's really more going beyond the course, I guess. Um, but if you think about the idea that you have a, a complex service that has a lot of entities, and in databases, you kind of don't really care about this because you always think about entities as having their own distinct tables, their own relations, right? If you think about the newspaper, let's say, um, um, you have the newspaper article, um, and then if your authors, right? So two tables, and they're linked in some sort of, you know, end-to-end uh, -end relationship um, because one article in a multiple authors and of course one, one author can author multiple articles and so on. So how do you deal with this in REST, right? So, and uh, one obvious pathway would be, of course, hey, yeah, you know, we can actually do it the following, right? Let's say organize by author first and then assume we can retrieve all the articles from the authors, right? But what happens if we're interested in articles that have multiple authors or certain conditions or combinations in them? And 
this is generally not a desirable way of uh, modeling a REST API because you can't anticipate the use case on the client side. What happens if they're not just interested in articles by author, but both interested in articles and authors independently, similar to you know, the, the, the um, relational database case. The idea is then to kind of make both of those first order resources, but link them internally. And uh, how this could possibly be done, it's uh, not as um, slightly more inconvenient, hang on. Um, this is also a document I'll come back to. Oh, uh, um, it's, it's, it's linked, of course, already. Um, yeah. So the idea would be basically then to kind of, in your, in your structure, assume you have the authors and you have the articles, right? Embed in the respective structure a link to the other entity. And that's where JSON hits its limits because it becomes slowly painful. Um, because links is not a kind of a native concept, but what would be here? Assuming this is right now an order product or something, that's actually a quite nice site. I, um, this is linked in your, in your wiki, so you can review it. Um, but if you, for example, have an article there and you want to link all the different authors, then you put a, a standardized way of linking those by saying, for example, what's the type of relationship author, right? What's the unique identifier for that author, right? Assuming it's you are the author, right? So then you need to uh, also provide the link to the distinctive particular resource, including ID, right? Which action uh, do you perform on it, right? Okay, that's a given, it's likely a get, right? You're probably not modifying it, but if you were to, then you can also provide this here, and then again, content type. So what you see here is the complete request specification that I just talked about earlier, what you need to provide, you, know? you need to have a UI, you need to have a, uh, the, the permissible REST methods, and then the corresponding content type, blah, 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 and so on. Um, but the idea, so that's the principle in, in, in REST, they call this, um, I always need to look that back up again because I don't want to pronounce the acronym, um, is, is this um, using uh, linkages of uh, resources via um, hyperlinks, right? So the idea is that internally you should provide the user with a way of linking different resources across the entire REST API as opposed to nesting it in a way, right? So, um, yeah, I do I I don't know. Um, yeah, here they go. Hypertext, hypertext as the engine of application state. I promise you one thing, I'm not asking that stuff in the exam, that's ridiculous, like no one can know that. But what you wanna take away from this is, think about like in relational terms, having those entities, and instead of kind of nesting one into the other, which is kind of messy, but could be intuitively make sense, you say, you know, articles, wanna look at the authors, don't do it. The idea is to link it internally somehow. There's no fixed standard for this, uh, or, well, that, that is the kind of convention, but there is flexibility in how you implement it. But one way, for example, is doing this way, right? By embedding the links to another resource into the resource you're retrieving. Right? Your get request basically would that have that content here that you can then machine pass if you wanted to uh, and, you know, resolve the corresponding other entities. So that's about this um, dealing with uh, complex nested structures um, um, topic that is quite an issue in the context of um, rest. You don't see it right now because you're dealing with uh, atomic, like, you know, individual entities, first of all entities, but it becomes a bit more complex if you actually think about how to map uh, relational structures into um, rest. Okay. The other thing is, you guys figured this out already, this is already relevant now, um, to some extent, because you're using external APIs. What about Subset. So um, one of the problems is that um, or one one of the problem that REST has, and there will be a future solution to this one that uh, CMX is working on, uh, is um, well not to REST generally, but an alternative um, 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 interface um, specification way that, that deals with this. But it's overfetching. Every time you want to get all students from NCNU, guess what? You get all the students from NCNU. And it's not just students from Jervik, it may also be the ones from Trondheim. So we're down 25,000 students if we have a GET request to uh, our, our hypothetical REST service provided by the admission office. And you're only interested in one. <laughs> so there's a bit of an inefficiency, you probably recognize that quite quickly, right? So especially you want to figure out what your student is, or only the ones from Jervik, or only the, I don't know, five older students, or you know it, right? So you can make it. So it's important to be aware, there are, of course, other features of HTTP you can exploit and should exploit when you design. That is the idea of having um, parameters, right? Those, those query strings. And um, at least for, for um, some of the endpoints, the idea was to kind of implement those as well, where you basically need to pass the UI and see if there's beyond the path, right? So students, for example, some specification of 
something with a question mark and following afterwards, right? So this is classical web technology um, a, a way of um, providing additional parameters that are injected, for example, in the website, whatever else, but it's additional parameters you should extract and use. So, you know, if you, uh, for example, have a want to, want to limit the history to one or have a limit of five, very relevant to the exam, you only have the first five responses, please. Well, uh, you, um, the, you implement in, you need to react to it, right? You may get this resp uh, the, the request via the URI, right? Um, because it's part of the assignment one effect, right? So they basically have an optional specification. It's generally the case, optional specifications of those uh, selectors. And then you need to deal with this, how to limit to five elements, right? It's generally not a big problem, especially in this case. Um, but um, uh, uh, the, the point here is more, how do we deal with the overfetching problem, right? So how can we avoid always to get all the resources? Because that's, we have only those very crude methods, right? Those, you know, crud methods. Um, and especially the read one, it's like super generic. Either you get one student or you get all of them or you get five, right? So, and that's the way of doing this. So kind of dealing with granularity can only be done using uh, kind of selections yeah, in REST. So that's, that's the standard to do it. You can also think about ranges, um, um, pagination as a problem. That's the classic one. So if you think about those typical listings of, on websites where you, um, or in GitHub, I think if you um, open someone's repos or a page, right, user page, and look at the repos, you only list like the 10 first repos or something, right? But what if you have 55, right? You kind of navigate through them by saying next, 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 right? And it's of course a co efficiency concern because the web service may not want to provide all the data in one go, especially if you're not interested in this. So that's called pagination, right? Where you actually click next, 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 next. And that's something you can model the same way here as well, right? Where you can say, for example, I, you know, for my output that I'm providing, please, um, I want to have, for example, a, uh, a role, you know, on a, on a big, big given page, um, I only want um, 25 rows to appear. And out of those, I want page six, <laughs> right? So you could navigate using REST to a particular page. If you think about how such a API could be implemented on GitHub side or Amazon side, whatever, this could be one way of doing this, right? Basically uh, linking to a um, subset by in inducing page limits and um, perhaps identifying a specific page and so on. So of course, super specific to the um, um, API you're implementing, but the, the fundamental function is quite straightforward. Everything following the question mark is this parameter and always has the structure key value, right? Key defined by you, value, of course, also kind of defined and interpreted by you. And they can be concatenated using the ampersand, right? So you can have multiple selectors um, as well. If you use this, this is super important to document by example, as people will not get this, right? Because it's too, too abstract, um, um, you know, so that's very important to kind of highlight an example of how this actually works. But you get the gist there, right? It's really about dealing with the, the output and reducing the output because you can't do it by UI anymore, you know? So, uh, oh, you shouldn't. Uh, that's my earlier point about the author's article when we, it's basically a subset of, you know, you have articles, you know, now I only want um, articles of a given author. You could think, okay, I just append it to the UI, but then you have this nesting problem and inverse relationship problem becomes messy. Here you should use that thing, right? So it would actually have subsect um, selection on that basis. Again, it completely uh, depends on your specific use case. If it's really an internal API and that the use case is extremely well defined, you will never know if it's public, then you have much more flexibility. This is more like thinking generically about REST APIs, what you should consider, especially if they're user facing, that is, uh, you know, outward facing in particular. Okay. Um, yeah, last point about you being a nice person. As a, on the server side, uh, is deal with you know user issues gracefully where possible, right? So, for example, if uh, someone omits that's a classic omits a trailing slash, just append it, right? You, you check the UI if there's a missing slash, just append it to ensure that the UI is complete and your thing doesn't fail. Don't just leave the user with a dangling you know response, whatever else. If the user forgets the content type specification, be a nice person, have a look with JSON, and then say, yeah, cool, I treat it anyway, right? So don't just react it because they forgot it. That's it, you, you should implement it, right? You need to be nice people. I mean, as you know, you're the professionals, but your users may not be. So uh, content type specification, that's um, the case. Um, and the error messages thing, I mentioned that before already, you know, think about as a user, as a customer. So don't just say, you know, 500 go away or 400 back request your problem. You know, please never use our API again, as opposed to, you know, 
having a bit more of a constructive uh, response to that one. So there's that element. So anytime you find this, another one is uh, default redirects. Um, if you're, for example, someone mistyping students, right? Find a way if you have a default handler that actually sets, uh, you know, um, those are the following in a, in a pro body you could, for example, write, we are pro for supporting the following endpoints. Please double check whether you used one of those, right? So instead, instead of having a 404 pointing to an invariant resource, which is okay, in the body you could also be more instructive and say, hey, uh, uh, you likely um, um, hit a URI or selected a path we don't support. Here's the link to the documentation, right? So, um, so be, be constructive in a sense, um, where, where possible and sensible. Okay. Okay, I think uh, yeah, we're well over time. The other aspect is versioning. I leave it in the slide set, but uh, we talked about versioning and the need for versioning for APIs. Um, you know, because then you can afford changes over time. There are different ways of doing this, either in the request or as part of the URI, or even in the header. You can sneakily put it in the header as well. We did it as part of URI. Only challenge there if you have a. Um, um, an API you need to maintain in the long run, it becomes a bit tricky because you need to suddenly maintain version 2, version 3, and version 5, right? As opposed to encoding it uh, and uh, just associated with particular requests, for example. Um, okay, anyway, I don't want to go into this one. Um, I will provide the resources and, of course, the slide set so you can iterate and think about this. But this is really more about your own um, professional um, um, practice going beyond, particular for assignment two. But in as far as error codes are concerned and completeness of requests and responses, content type as a keyword, please consider those. A lot of talking, questions? Straightforward, relatively, right? Uh, how, so like in terms of anticipating uh, user behavior for, um, yeah. for the yeah. assignment one, like how, how like much? How forgiving should you get? For example, so like the dates, right? Yeah. Like if they if they have the date formatting yeah. completely wrong, yeah. you know, because it, it goes either than yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. American format versus uh, European format, for example. Right. Yeah. Like should we anticipate that as well? Or no, I think for the assignment that's 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 overdoing, but what you want to likely check. Uh, what, what you could go down to is to say, hey, your date format doesn't make sense. That would be something you could sensibly infer. Because you also don't necessarily want to expose the wrong date as input to another API. Because otherwise you will likely get an error there or no return, whatever else. And you kind of want to know what that means in that context, right? No content could mean two things. Either they didn't find that date or the date is invalid and I can't be bothered responding to you. But uh, I think it would be sensible to at least you know, do a bit of sanity check. For example, if the middle... Uh, 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 middle two digits are greater than 12, guess what? I mean, the 13 months has yet to be invented, so that's likely not flying. So that's something you need to consider anyway, even if you want to translate whatever you know um, parameter has been provided anyway and before you send it to another API. I wouldn't go down the route and anticipating or, and that's your actual question, I believe, uh, you know, to support different date formats. No, right? Just saying your date was wrong, at least this is concrete enough, telling user, hey, your date specification is wrong enough. That's cool enough because then I know I got the UI actually right. It's just that parameter I got wrong. And if the limit parameter is probably also okay, it's just that one I need to attend to. That's much more specific than saying that request go away. Right? So so don't don't overdo it. But I think it's more like think about you as a user that you know is poking into API the first time and trying out stuff. Trying different URIs. What happens if you get your know, have an un, un, uninitialized or non-existing endpoint? You know how does your system behave? Try it basically. That's what I mean. Like do the implementation, then take you know few days rest and go at it again. And just from a user side, use Postman, poke it, and see see what happens. I mean you can't anticipate all issues, um, but um, that's that's more like an encouragement because you don't want to think only from an engineer perspective. You also need to think from a user perspective. Uh, a critical uh, perspective. I always have the positive thinking. Oh, people use my stuff as intended to, of course. How would they do it otherwise? Whereas well, the critical thinking, which is like, uh, let's break it. Uh, which kind of, you guys are brilliant at breaking stuff, actually. So every time we try something new out, right, we just give it to our students and they find a way of breaking it. So, um, you know, so that's the kind of attitude you need to have towards your own work as well sometimes. Uh, but not while developing it, of course, but uh, you, you know what I mean, right? So and the best way of doing this is kind of to step back a bit, forget about the internals and treat the API as an API, as an interface. Yeah, without knowing too much about the internals. It's hard. That's why you have dedicated tested teams that are not you, right? Your, your, your quality assurance, quality uh, team should be someone who is not involved in development because they can, or by definition, they have this abstraction and will only look at it from the outside, from a functional perspective. 
And you will always have the structural perspective in mind. Oh, you know, how do I handle this inside? That is really robust. That shouldn't be a problem. So but that's not something that should concern you when you're trying to break your own API. Other comments? Yeah. Yeah? Let me just say that all four of us still Yes, you could do that. Exactly. You could, in principle, do that. I, I wouldn't see why not, really. Yeah. So um, that's a perfectly sensible move. Because 404 means, literally means resource doesn't exist. Well, what do we do afterwards? Just redirect them or whatever else. You know, or provide the link in the content body. But redirect is fine as well. You, as long as you, um, um, uh, those are kind of decision um, choices you make, strategies you take, um, just document them, right? The fact that that's the case from a, um, from a um, developer side. So when you read me say, you know, how do I deal with, uh, for example, my, my handling of 404s, right? And if you don't deal with them at all, well, you don't document it, I guess. Um, yeah, so those choices are really nice to deal with. Um, yeah, especially if you have standardized output formats, it's really nice that you can embed it. You also want to think that your user of your web service can actually be someone who, you know, creates wraps a web page around it, right? Meaning the more structured your response, the more easy it is for them to wrap it. So, other thoughts? No magic, right? So, um, a bit of common sense uh, mixed with some um, lessons learned over time. Anyway, I'll um, put this online and uh, link resources, related resources. And again, it's something you want to come back to in a few weeks when it's really about you getting more productive in designing your own API, some of them. But it's good to have them at early at the back of your head. Okay. No comments? Good. Good. I think that's it. I mean, I kept you well over time. I'm surprised you're so forgiving because um, that's completely a violation of Norwegian virtues to be precise. Uh, so, unfortunately, I lost those some time ago. Um, but I'm working on it. So, so, thanks for your attention. Have a good afternoon. I hope to come back. Uh, you come back here. I see, uh, I see this as an indication of approval. Uh, if you don't come back and hide in the stream world again, then I'm. I see I did something wrong, so.